I am so thrilled to have Lee Schaefer again from Edge of the Woods Nursery. If you've never been to Edge of the Woods, I am also a customer of theirs. The products that they have, many of them grown from seed, have all done so well in my garden, and they are just a wealth of information. They also do these really fun nights, uh, great nights for their uh, clients, and that's how I met Brandon. Um, Brandon hosted us. He is a horticulturist at Edge of the Woods, and he started telling us all these really interesting things about how native seeds are dispersed, and I'm like, this is more fun than a barrel of monkeys. We have to do a webinar on this. So this was dreamed up last fall because I grow pawpaw trees in my yard and they have pawpaws with fruit, which I was introduced to. And I don't know if you knew that, Louise, at your nursery, someone brought them during a, um, you know, a, a customer appreciation night like several years before. Yeah, and yeah. I really enjoyed them. And then Brandon told me the secrets. Hi, Linda from Narbeth um, of pawpaws. And I'm so excited to tell you some secrets I learned about my pawpaw trees that I think you are going to be the star of your football parties this afternoon because <laughs> you're going to be able to tell some really cool stories about seed dispersal. So I just want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for being here, Brandon and Louise. It's great to see you virtually. Looking Thank you for having you. us. This is a real treat. I'm glad yeah. you're putting it together. It is my pleasure. And um, Brandon, I am going to make it so you can share your screen. He's Irene. got some beautiful <laughs> pictures here. So Brandon, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so my name's Brandon Everett and I've been at Edge of the Woods Nursery. This is going to be my fifth, fifth season. Um, I went to college at Penn State University um, for agricultural sciences, but I specialized in horticulture. Um, I've been planting native plants as long as I've been gardening. I, I got started with native plants uh, when I was about 11. Uh, I uh, went to a junior naturalist camp at the Lehigh Gap Nature Center. For anyone who's local to the Lehigh Valley, you may, you may know about that place. Um, great place. And I was introduced to native plants there and their importance. And I just took to it like a duck to water. I just loved it. And um, sure enough, uh, the Nature Center had been getting plants from Edge of the Woods for a few years. Um, and it was just natural that I had then met uh, Louise and, and Sue, the other co-owner of the nursery. And they, they were always so kind to me as a kid and encouraging me. Um, so sure enough, it was just natural progression that one day I would end up growing plants for them at Edge of the Woods. Um, so that's my story, how I ended up involved in natives. Um, and I just, I love them. I can't get, I can't get enough of them. I hope I never get sick of them. <laughs> There's always oh, a new plant. So it's very exciting. You've got fans here in the chat. They're saying they're your biggest fan. He's so helpful, knowledgeable, and you're going to see that in this presentation, but certainly when you're in the nursery, you won't believe what you will learn about your native plants. So are you able to share your screen there? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Perfect. All right, we can see it. Great. Good. Got it. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So I can probably skip that. So we're ready to start. We just want to dive right into it. Yeah, go yep, for it. That sounds great. Okay. Awesome. So again, today we're going to be talking about some really neat ways that our native plants uh, disperse their seeds and and Obviously what that means is how they spread their seeds out into the surrounding environment and therefore continue on growing new generations of their species. Uh, this is how plants move over time, how they end up in new geological or geographical locations, um, and how it also is very depend dependent on how they interact with other organisms um, in their environment as well as some abiotic factors in their environment too. So on the screen in front of you, um, you see five photos that have various types of seeds pictured of different types of plants. And these are some of the most basic methods, right, of seed dispersal that most of us are aware of, um, that a lot of us learned in grade school when we talked about the basics of, of nature and plants and, and animals. 
Um, you see a, a brown or a black bear there eating some kind of berry. I, I can't actually identify what the berry is through the photo, um, but it's probably something invasive. So I'm sorry for the native purists out there. Um, but the bear is eating the berries and obviously just like the goldfinch below picking at the seeds and the echinacea. Um, animals tend to be one of our largest seed dispersal methods. Plants produce seeds often in fleshy fruits like berries. They're very appealing to animals to eat. So when they eat the fruit, obviously it passes through and animals, unlike plants, uh, spend the majority of their day moving around um, from place to place. So they disperse seeds as they move. Um, in the middle there, you see some seed with the feathery pappas on them. That's from the 2022 perennial plant of the year, a uh, little blue stem, one of our best native grasses out there, uh, especially for supporting larvae of butterflies. Um, this grass, like most grasses, is dispersed by wind. Um, so you can see the little pappas there that catches in the wind and that grass seed may blow miles. Um, so it can really get a lot of, a lot of mileage out of that little feather. Um, and it, it only weighs a fraction <laughs> of a fraction of an ounce. So clearly it can move a great distance if there's a strong wind. Um, on the bottom in those beautiful green fleshy leaves, that's one of our native aquatic plants called golden club. Um, and those fruits, it's not so much a fleshy berry um, that an animal would wanna eat. It's really just a buoyant structure. So it's filled with a lot of air and in there is the seed and that buoyant structure can float down moving water and end up miles away and eventually get caught up on a little shore or a bank or in some some organic debris in the water and can grow right there and take root. And finally, the last one there is a plant that a lot of us do not like, um, the burrs, right? They get caught in our clothing and even worse, if you have dogs and they get caught in their fur and then you have to cut it out of their fur. Uh, it can really be a nuisance, but on the plants end, a truly ingenious method of seed dispersal because all it has to do is wait for some large Humpty Dumpty furry animal to walk by and get it caught in its fur and as far as the animal goes until it finally gets irritated enough to brush it out of its coat or it falls out over time, that seed's going to hang on and move right with it. So uh, there's a question in the chat about what is the name of that burr? Well, unfortunately, I know that one all too well. That is burdock. And uh, I was cleaning up my garden last season and for, unfortunately for me, did not have my hair in a ponytail and I had burdock all in my oh. hair. I'm just going to warn you. Let me tell you about the mistakes I've made in gardening so you can go make new ones. These are not a lot of fun to get out of long hair. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> it was. <laughs> And that's, that's actually a great photo of it too, because if you look really closely, you can see why it really is so difficult to remove because each end of those little spikes are hooked. Um, so when you pull, it just, it hooks right in like a barb um, and it's caught. So it's a very effective mechanism for seed dispersal uh, and very effective at annoying <laughs> gardeners that get them stuck in their clothing yeah, and their hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving right along. So again, just overview, That's those are some of the basic methods that we're all aware of. And some of the things we'll talk about are just variations of these, especially with the animals, but we hope to uh, step out of the norm a bit and think about some really unusual examples. So our first plant that we're gonna talk about is one of my favorite plants ever. Um, and it's probably the species that got me interested in native plants. Um, this is the wild bleeding heart. Um, it is related to the standard old fashioned garden bleeding heart that like everyone's grandma had in their garden um, with the very large showy bloom. Um, but that plant is an ephemeral which tends to die back and go dormant by summer once it gets hot. Um, but this native bleeding heart, this wild species is not an ephemeral. Um, it's a large clump or a smaller clumping perennial um, but it's, it's visible all season, uh, minus winter when it goes dormant then. Uh, but it comes up quite early. Uh, it'll be popping up early next month, and it will probably already be blooming by the end of next month. Uh, and it will continue blooming pretty much until uh, the hard freezes stop it. It's about our longest blooming native perennial, which makes it an exceptional 
species for using in the garden um, because everyone likes something that blooms all the time. Um, there's very few wild plants that will do that, let alone plants at all that will bloom always. Um, but this is one that really can just keep, keep showing off all season long, which is great. Um, scientifically, it's known as Dicentra eczemia, and it does have some related uh, cousins in the same genus right here in Pennsylvania. Um, if you know Dutchman's Britches and Squirrel Corn, um, those are two other Dicentras that we have with white flowers. Um, the reason that this plant intrigued me so much, one, because it's an endangered species in Pennsylvania, um, and I love anything rare, um, and I love kind of highlighting them and giving them some of the, the justice that I think they need. Um, and it, interestingly, even though it's endangered in Pennsylvania, uh, at the Lehigh Gap Nature Center, which is just about 10 minutes from where I live, thank you, there is a huge... Um, population of this plant that grows naturally. Um, and when I saw it there and I was told it was endangered, I just thought that was like the coolest thing that basically right in my backyard is this thriving population of this rare plant. Um, so I thought that was pretty great. Um, but what makes this plant really, really interesting is its seed dispersal method. It's a great example of a plant that uses a very uh, special structure. Hmm. There we go. So unlike peonies, which though often considered need ants, they don't, um, but some plants really do. And the bleeding heart is one of those plants, our native bleeding heart. It needs ants in order for its seeds to spread. Um, and it's so, it needs them so much that they've kind of formed this symbiotic uh, sort of relationship where the plant produces a very special uh, structure on its seed to lure ants to find its seed and carry them away. And if you look at the fruit there of the plant, so it kind of looks like a little miniature green banana. Um, and you can see the shriveled remains of the flower above it. And inside the banana, those black seeds. And what you see um, near the seed, or I should say on the seed, are those little whitish gelatinous deposits. And those are called ileosomes. And an ileosome is basically just a small, tiny little deposit of fats, proteins, lipids, um, things that are very attractive to ants because they love to eat those things. Um, they love anything high in uh, protein and fat and sugar and all that stuff. So this is the perfect little attractant. And what happens is when these fruits split open, uh, the seed simply just falls to the ground right below the plant, right at its foot. And just like most humans, plants do not want their children growing up at their feet and living there forever. Uh, they want them to move out and get on and go start their own lives somewhere in the world. So that little ileosome is like the perfect little handle for the ant to grab on, carry this seed back to its nest or, or wherever the ant is living, and consume that ileosome or more likely feed the ileosome material to its larvae because that material high in uh, lipids and protein is excellent for a developing ant larvae. Um, and then the seed is left unharmed because the ileosome is attached to the outer uh, shell of the seed. So the little seed is, is perfectly unharmed and it's left behind in this detritus layer where the ants live where it can grow and germinate into a new bleeding heart. And I, I think that is just kind of fascinating to think about that this little ant has such a big chore. Um, really, really cool. Do we wanna pause for a question or should we learn more about this big, big chore for this little critter? Absolutely, we certainly can take, if you've got questions, feel free to, feel free to throw them in the chat or uh, we have uh, Facebook being monitored by um, Edge of the Woods, so feel free to uh, put them on the Facebook as well. Uh, this was the story you told at our uh, little get together. And I was just absolutely amazed by this because first of all, I love bleeding heart. I'm married to a heart doctor. So of course we have to have bleeding heart in our garden. Um, so it's one of my favorites, but I also just didn't understand what role that ants played in the garden. So to make this, uh, make this move. So 
One question we've got is, uh, do other eczemias use this same method? Yes, and we'll get to that. We'll mention some more plants, but yes, that's a good question. Um, all three of the dicentra species in Pennsylvania produce seed with eleosomes, as do many other plants, and, and we'll, we'll mention a few of those in a couple minutes. Good question. All right, so we'll move on. So again, tiny little critter, an ant, Whenever you think of something little, an ant is one of those examples that pops to mind, but it has this huge, huge, huge responsibility. So what I've kind of created here in this graphic, what we're pretending to look at is an overview of a Pennsylvania woodland. If you zoom in really close, you'll see palm trees. So ignore the fact that it's probably a tropical jungle and we'll just pretend it's a, it's a Pennsylvania woodland. And what I've created there are these little circles which represent populations of bleeding heart. Um, the bigger the circle, the more there are. So what you see is the bleeding heart kind of existing uh, in about half of this little snapshot of the woodland, but there aren't any existing on the other side. And simply due to the fact that critters, little ants, have not been moving the seeds that direction yet. But as you can see, where the bigger circles are, there are little circles budding out from that. So where the big populations are, they're slowly spreading out among the woodland. Now, with such a tiny little ant, you can imagine that it takes a long time for a population to move quite a distance. It, many of those seeds might only move a few feet. Um, so it could take generations and generations and generations of plants to, to really move a good distance across a forest. So what happens then when in 2022, right, they come through and they build a, a highway through the road, through the, through the woodland, um, a new highway leading to some, I don't know, new development or something somewhere, right? Um, now the habitat has become fragmented. So now you have a human structure, a road, um, separating one side of the other of this woodland. And now you have a roadway in between the bleeding hearts on one side and the big potential space for them to grow on the other. And that is especially difficult for a little tiny ant to traverse with a big seed in its mouth. Um, one, roads get hot, right? So critters cook. Uh, and two, um, cars and vehicles that will squish them if they're not quick enough. And three, it's just when you're only this big, a road is like, massive, right? I mean, that's like you trying to walk across the entire city of Allentown in a couple seconds and hope that you don't get squashed or bake alive, right? So it's quite the, cho it's quite the chore. Is it impossible? Certainly not. It can, it can absolutely be done. Um, and sometimes even what happens in situations like this <clears throat> is you could have seeds uh, hypothetically end up on like road edges and gets kicked aside by passing cars and there's water flowing over the road that can wash it to the other side. It's certainly not impossible, but it became a lot more difficult. Now, let's say next year, some land development company bought some of this land up and they've cleared it and they've paved a big massive spot of this land, um, basically to build a big warehouse. And unfortunately now, not only have they destroyed um, a large segment of the habitat and a good population of the bleeding hearts right with it, um, but now they've pushed the remnant population even further from the potential to spread into the new woodland. Now there's a parking lot and a building and, and um, industrial um, traffic going through there all day. And, and, all, and, and also pollutants and all kinds of things, right? So there's all these factors working against this plant um, and especially the little ants that are dispersing the plant. Um, and in this situation where I said with the road, it's probably not impossible for it to get there or back to the other side. Um, but unfortunately, once roadways start building out with parking lots and buildings for you know a half a mile on each side, it, it does become quite impossible for anything like that to traverse through there and potentially make it somewhere to another natural area. Um, so when we think about how these plants move around, uh, it's not just the amazing story of the little ant carrying the seed through the woods, 
but it might also boil down to the amazing story of the little ant traversing the four lane highway or you know the concrete slabs and and, and macadam and all this stuff that um it, it doesn't make it easy it really doesn't make it easy it makes it very difficult uh and in pennsylvania for a plant that's already endangered right this could be like a really awful situation um Thankfully, once plants do kind of get some recognition of a status of endangerment, um, they do get some protections. Um, the, there are no federal protections for the bleeding heart because it's not a federally endangered species, um, but there are some state protections. So the state DCNR and the state EPA um, could potentially uh, put a stop to, to construction if they find the endangered plant growing there. Um, it has happened, or they will move the plants. Um, anyone from my area up here in Carbon County that's very familiar with the uh, old zinc company outside of Palmerton, um, they, in the last few years, they've recently went in and they've demolished all the old buildings um, and they've started reworking the land, burying it with fill, trying to do something with it. Um, but one thing that happened is uh, when these developers went in and started working, the EPA showed up and said, whoa, 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 you have a big population of this bleeding heart growing here. You, you need to move them. So they actually, um, they had a team of volunteers come out. They dug all these bleeding hearts and they actually transplanted them to the nature center across the river. Um, so, but they, they wouldn't have actually been allowed to uh, progress forward if they weren't gonna agree to either move them or create a, a reserve area basically on their land. So, Depending That's on very who's... encouraging, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But it is very hard um, for plants to get recognition um, and, and animals alike. It's very difficult to get an animal or plant listed um, on a protected status list because of all the politics connected to it like such. Um, so it does take a lot of activism and a lot of people, uh, very, very loud voice people to push uh, for those critters uh, to get on there. Um, but once they're on, the protections are there and, and it, it does help them quite a bit. So this has generated a few questions. So is the right. aliazone required to be removed before the seed can germinate? No. Okay. And uh, do you have them at the nursery? Yes, okay. we do. I think there's this lots of humans willing to be ants and plant them for you. <laughs> Which is like the best thing we can do for this plant is spread it around and plant it in our gardens. And one great thing, at least, you know, I've had this plant in my garden now for uh, 12, 13 years or so, and it now it grows everywhere. Uh, it pops up everywhere. And that's oh, because- Oh, excellent. Carry I have them. a lot of areas where I could use more, so that's good to know. <laughs> it, it will, it is one of those plants that you'll find come up in uh, cracks of bricks and sidewalks because the ants leave them there. Uh, so you'll find it in strange places. You can find it growing up on logs and all kinds of stuff because the ants will carry the seeds to strange places. Very cool, very cool. So what's so, next for us? Well, back to that question, um, do other dicentri use it? And yes, they do. So these are this is a snapshot here of a few plants that use uh, eliosomes, um, and there are many more. But there is a theme here among these plants, and it's that these are our woodland wildflowers that grow uh, low to the ground, uh, under the shade of, of our mature forests. Um, now, they're also mostly ephemerals, um, so plants that go dormant uh, not long after producing that seed. Uh, again, because once the forest fills in around them, it gets so shady down there that there's no point in them uh, staying up for the whole summer because they're just growing in the dark shade and they can't grow uh, anyway. So they collect all that sunlight early in the season while the trees haven't leafed out yet. They bloom quickly, they seed quickly, and then unfortunately for all of us that love them so much, we have to wait until the following spring to see them again. But it does make it uh, special for the garden. But all these plants produce eliosomes. Um, violets are another one that often produce them. Uh, there, there are quite a few out there. So one of the questions is, is do deer like this plant? No, so that is something I definitely should have mentioned because the bleeding heart, and I, I will never say this word, this phrase about any other plant, but I'm so confident in this one, I will say it. Deer don't eat it. They won't. 
Uh, rabbits also don't eat it. I do believe that it must uh, be rather poisonous to these herbivores um, because none of them touch it. Uh, I have seen bleeding heart growing in the, in the woods near Palmerton and, and the outskirts of Palmerton where there's nothing else growing on the forest floor except for ferns and bleeding hearts because it's the only things that the deer don't eat. Uh, so it is very fascinating. And as far as it being endangered, that sure helps that the deer aren't, aren't eating it. That'll, that'll help it a lot. Yeah. So um, I, to, to, just to reiterate uh, Brandon's point here, a lot of these ephemerals grow in my uh, tiny forest behind my house, which is absolutely not fenced. Uh, and we have a ton of deer and they really don't seem to prefer any of these. I don't ever find them uh, eaten to the ground or anything. Uh, there are a couple of questions about, um, and Janice says, yay, that they're deer resistant. Uh, <laughs> um, it, could the ants get into the house uh, if you planted them close to the house? I don't usually find this type of ant in my house. I usually find sugar ants in my house. That, that's a great question. And I, I almost always get this question when I talk about this at the nursery. Someone says, oh, well, is it going to make me have more ants? And the answer really is no. Um, the ants are already there. <laughs> ants are probably one of the most numerous organisms in the world. Um, they're kind of everywhere and there's thousands of species of them. Um, I think they live on every continent. I don't know about Antarctica, but they, they really live everywhere. There's an ant for every habitat and situation. Um, so you're not going to lure more ants. Uh, it, it's just not that powerful of an attractant. Um, it simply is kind of a matter of the seed drops and a passing ant finds it. It's not so much, uh, it sends out so much signal or anything like that. So Linda would like to know what the plant on the lower right is. Do you know what it is? I do, but you can answer that one. Okay, it's so that's Spring Beauty. Um, and that one appears to be the Carolina Spring Beauty. Um, there's two species. There's also the Virginia Spring Beauty, but the Virginia one has very narrow grass-like leaves and that one kind of looks to have a bit fatter leaves. So it's probably the Carolina one. Um, that's a very cute plant for a spring garden. Um, it's, I, I kind of look at it like it's our native crocus because it comes up like really early and it's got these very tiny thin leaves and the flowers are also very tiny. They're not big like a crocus, but they are very cute and it will bloom for, uh, quite a bit. It'll yeah. bloom for a couple of weeks. Absolutely. Uh, somebody says deer like my trillium. Oh no. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. I, maybe I should specify that when I said about deer not eating it, I was referring uh, specifically to the bleeding heart. Um, I'm not sure that deer won't eat some of the other plants here. Um, I know I've had bunnies nip off my trilliums and I've had bunnies eat my bluebells in the past. Those are my bluebells there in my garden. Um, on a good okay. year when something and, did eat them. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm getting some questions about, will these grow in the shade? And uh, the majority of these are all in my shade garden. Um, and so, you know, I find them in shady areas too in our, uh, that the wildflower preserve I was talking about in Conestoga, they're in uh, dappled shade or in almost full shade in some of those areas. So if you've got a shade garden, these are gonna be great additions and uh, someone asked, are they good companion plants? The answer is yes. Yes. Um, they, they, they play well with others. Yeah, all these plants complement each other very well. Uh, one thing I will say about them, though, is when you plant ephemerals, you want to plan ahead. Because if you plant an area with just ephemerals, come summer, you, you're, you're not going to have anything to look at. Um, so the bleeding heart is actually the perfect plant to intersperse with ephemerals because it doesn't go dormant. Um, so, and it just kind of has this really nice uh, dissected fern-like foliage that's pretty all season and, and it will bloom all season. So it's a perfect plant to tuck in with these plants. I, you can't see it in the photo, but just to the right of that uh, bluebell in my garden is a big bleeding heart. So they, they do work very well together, yeah. So we're getting asked by some folks who are not familiar with these plants to identify them. So you want to start with sure. um, you know, the left and go right? Sure. So I'll start with, uh, uh, yeah, I'll start with the one all the way on the left. Um, the white kind of winged like flower. 
That is Dutchman's Britches, um, named because somebody back way back when looked at it upside down and thought that it looked like a pair of britches, which I guess it kind of does. Um, at the top, the yellow is the wood poppy, um, which is often misidentified as the celandine poppy, which is an invasive plant, greater celandine. But this is just our, this is our native wood poppy. Uh, next to that is the bluebells, the Virginia bluebells. Uh, at the bottom right is the spring beauty. And then in the middle bottom is our white trillium, trillium grandiflorum. And one question from the audience is how big do they get? The bleeding heart generally grows like eight inches to 18 inches tall. I, I usually get them about a foot tall, 16 inches is pretty average. And, and they can get wide. I've had them grow to a, over two feet wide. Wow. Um, and they're a very easy one to divide. You want to dig it up and pull it apart. The crown breaks easily. So for people that love plants that multiply in their own and are, you know, you can build more with just investing in a couple, that's a good one to to buy because you can divide it later down the road. And the Latin name of the wood poppy? Uh, Styloflorum diphylum. Right. I think. Really funny. And great job, by the way. Put a spot yeah. on me. <laughs> You did awesome on the spot. And uh, when should you divide it? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I've usually divided them in the spring. When I start seeing the little buds starting to break open um, and the plants starting to break dormancy is when I've done them. Um, you can do them in the fall. Um, it's such a hardy plant. I would do it anytime. If you do it in the summer though, you're gonna to wanna to cut it back quite a bit and you're gonna water it uh, consistently until it's uh, settled back in. Um, but even in the spring, if we have a dry spell and you divide it, you're, you're gonna to need to water them until they're rooted back in. But I, that, that's one that I've found is not too fussy about time of year undividing. Good to know. All right, so what's next for us? All right, moving on. So if one of our common woodland wildflowers that you might not have seen on that little uh, board there was the May apple. May apple is one of our, I would say it's one of our most commonly seen uh, understory herbaceous plants, uh, flowering ones in Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, I see it everywhere and I, I even see it growing along the woods when there's a, a road going through a woodland and stuff. It's it's a great plant and the reason we see it everywhere is because where there's one there's a thousand because it it creeps by its roots and it creates a very large colony so it's easy to spot even from a distance because again where there's one there's a thousand and it's always easy to see a big pile of something as opposed to one um it's an it's a unique plant because genetically it's all by itself so it's in its own genus, Podophyllum, all alone in there with no friends. Um, it did have friends, but they've all been reclassified recently. Uh, some of some people out there that are real plant collectors have probably paid exuberous amounts of money for Asian May apples, which have this absolutely gorgeous mottled foliage. Um, but really, our our native May apple is all you need. It's such a beautiful plant, and it's so unique and so neat. Um, and it does produce um, a fruit that is asterisk edible, asterisk only if eaten properly. Um, <laughs> deadly if not, so keep in mind. Um, this is the May apple colony overview there. When you see this plant in the woods in the spring, this is how it looks. It just looks like this almost floating layer of leaves over these little dainty stems. And if you look close in that image, it, it was on the last slide. Um, let me go back actually. You can see the flower there um, between the crotch of the two leaves. So a May apple plant will either have one or two leaves. If it has one, it won't bloom. If it has two, it will bloom. Uh, it's a very predictable plant. Um, and that just has to do with the age of the stalk really. Uh, so you can see looking down over that image, you know, if you look close, some appear to have one leaf, some look like they have two. Um, and you can see a couple blooms. If you look sort of towards the middle, you can see them under there where there's a break in the foliage. And that bloom 
is mostly pollinated by bees um, and it will become this cute little greenish fruit, which I think looks like a lemon, but it's been named a May apple. Uh, so it's an apple, I guess. But uh, that little fruit, which they're not very big. Uh, uh, Heather, would you would you compare it to like a little? Yeah, it's about the size of a walnut. About a walnut. That's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not very big, and it notice the position of it on the plant. Uh, it's not up at the top, right where birds and tall animals would conveniently spot it under all that foliage. It's sort of under the canopy, which is unusual for plants because generally, when a plant puts all that energy into producing seed and a big fleshy fruit which really is it's producing for something else to eat, um, they show it off. You know, think about uh, shrubs that produce berries um, or even the fruits that we eat, like apples and, and oranges, right? They're brightly colored. They stand out on the tree all over it. Um, at when, when, you know, and they're, they're showing the seeds off to everything possible. So what is eating this, this little fruit that the plant doesn't mind that it's not showing it off to everything else in the world? Well, it all relates to that really cool word, chelinochery, which I probably butchered. So anyone out there watching that knows it better than me, I'm so sorry, but chelinochery it is. And that word is a very, very specific kind of seed dispersal that is driven by reptiles. Um, the unlikely seed dispersal, uh, you never would have thought it, but there are a lot of reptiles out there that are not these, uh, bloodthirsty animals like we often think of when we think of crocodiles and snakes right, that just love to eat other things. Um, there are some very docile plant-eating reptiles out there as well, uh, like tortoises and a lot of the turtles and a lot of iguanas and larger lizards and things like that. So they do uh, disperse seed, uh, which I find rather fascinating. Um, and that little guy there in the image, that is a probably a very familiar looking turtle to a lot of us that live here in, in the Northeast United States. That is a box turtle, and that is the Eastern box turtle. So that is the kind that you will see in Pennsylvania and surrounding states. Um, and that box turtle is a very unique turtle because it's probably, it's one of the only land turtles that is equally inept on land as it is in water. So even though it prefers to live on land like a tortoise, it can, it's quite agile in the water, just like a terrapin or another kind of aquatic turtle. Um, and everybody loves finding these guys. Uh, I've been finding the same one at my house now for the last several years. And there she is right there, uh, or he, I think, sorry. Um, but I see that box turtle at my house every spring without fail. Um, and that is the patch of May apple in the woods behind my house. Um, so I, I like to think because those woods weren't always there. Um, I live on what used to be a very old farm. So uh, part of those woods are actually old apple trees. So there was an orchard there and everything. And those May apples were not there a hundred years ago because it was a working farm. Uh, so I like to believe that the box turtle may have brought the May apple back into that little wood lot uh, where now there's a thriving population. Um, and you'll notice uh, looking at that name under box turtle, it's a scientific name. I do have a subspecies listed because the box turtle is a wide, wide ranging animal. Um, and because it's so wide ranging, it has a lot of these subspecies that have uh, just kind of occurred through ge geographical isolation. But the brown portion of that, the light brown, uh, that's the Eastern box turtle. So that same turtle that we find in Pennsylvania is found all the way along basically the whole eastern United States down to Florida where it becomes the Florida box turtle. And what's especially interesting about that map is if we look at the distribution of the May apple in comparison, um, the May apple's range is quite similar. Granted, it does go a bit more north, um, a bit more, but even if we look at especially like um, Michigan there, right? About halfway up the state, the May apples recorded, and about halfway up the state is where the box turtles recorded. Uh, so I think that's really neat um, how the range of the two overlaps so much, and it really does support the theory that the box turtle is perhaps one of the main uh, seed dispersal dispersers of the May apple. 
Um, now other animals will eat this too. Um, so it's not just box turtles, but it is especially interesting how the plant almost appears to serve them right up, given that they're at the right height and just the perfect size for them to eat. Um, it's like a little turtle, little turtle meal, so. So I have a lot of these turtles in my pollinator garden. Uh, a year before last, when the monarchs were super late to get here to central Pennsylvania, I said, apparently I planted my pollinator garden for the box turtles, not realizing that they were eating my May apples, which is really cool. Um, and that was a question from the audience is, can you eat the May apples? Can you explain when is the appropriate time to eat them? <laughs> so Heather, I'll let you tackle it because I actually have not eaten them. Yeah. Um, because I unfortunately have never been able to pick one at just the right moment because something has always beat me to it. So Heather, you go ahead and explain. Yeah. So I have a small colony that has migrated from my uh, neighbor's yard into my yard, which I was super happy that that has happened. And it just continues to expand and expand in my shade garden. Uh, but last year I was actually able to eat one. Um, and when you want to eat it is when it is ripe. Until it is ripe, it is poisonous. So <laughs> there is a cautionary tale there. Uh, make sure that it is ripened. And it looked yellow like a lemon and it was very, very, very soft and I could squeeze it. And um, I saved the seeds from one of my friends who starts thousands of native seeds for our local wildlife um, groups, including the Master Gardeners here in central Pennsylvania, so um, that she could start some new ones. But um, I have these in my tiny forest too. And uh, like you, Brandon, I never see fruit on those because something eats them. And I have a feeling it's the turtles. Yeah, 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 they love them. Um... And uh, on that note, too, how you said about the ones uh, migrating from your neighbor's yard into yours, um, the whole see once, you know, you see a thousand thing. The, the, the mayapple, too, important to note what the seed dispersal is. The mayapple doesn't bank on successful seed reproduction. Um, when you see a mayapple colony, it probably all started from one seed. Um, because they spread more dependably by their roots. Uh, so if you, if you were to dig up a mayapple, you would find it connected, like you would pull up this huge expanse of interconnected, long, fleshy, thick roots. Um, so it, while the box turtles are definitely dispersing the seed and they definitely do produce seed, just that one little fruit per plant, right? So they're, they're not banking on seed dispersal, um, which it's not atypical of plants that produce like this, that they don't bank on it. Um, and it just goes to show that nature always finds a way, right? So in the event that there weren't box turtles in an area or, or it was like a fenced area or something and wildlife couldn't get in there, the mayapple could still spread outward um, it's not going to go a mile, right? Because it, it can't just disconnect and walk away. Um, but it can spread outward. And hopefully, like you said, Heather, maybe those roots can migrate somewhere that's a little bit better. So like if your neighbor yard, if your neighbor's yard was fenced and turtles couldn't get in through the wire, but they went under the fence and crept into your yard where turtles could get it, that's pretty cool. So, it, you know, the plant, they, they find a way. Absolutely. And Linda is asking, what are the best conditions for the May apple? And I think your picture really demonstrates that well, because that's what my tiny forest looks like. It's dappled shade. And then my shade garden, uh, I would say the majority of the May apples are in most, most, most likely full shade or part shade. Yeah. Shaded and moist. Yes. Uh, you're going to want consistently moist or even wet soils for a May apple. Um, it, you can see the two plants that are growing with the mayapple there, or I'm sorry, the one plant uh, is the skunk cabbage. Um, so the little lime green shoots are little skunk cabbages growing. So it's definitely a wet spot there. Um, so where one grows, the other can often be found growing. Um, so I, I just, I would avoid direct hot sun and I would avoid dry soils. But other ones are pretty adaptable. Yeah. Do you need uh, distinctly, genetically distinct plants to get a mayapple fruit? 
Wow. Now that's a very good question. And I would, if I was a betting man, I'd say, yeah, probably. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, they could be self-fertile. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I suspect again, they are because I didn't plant mine. Uh, the one that fruited in my yard, like mm-hmm. I said, crept through um, mine. We have a just a, a broad iron fence and it crept under the fence and into my uh, shade garden. So right. it fruited. I, I haven't planted anything um, that's distinctive there. So my, my guess is you're spot on. And it, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. What, um, what next would you, um, well, what do you have for us? these are just a few other plants because we don't want to just think that the turtle will only eats one seed. Um, so these are a few other things that grow in our woods that turtles may also be uh, more of an aid in dispersing. We think so. We have our wild strawberry. Um, the little black raspberry looking thing is called a dewberry, which is a ground creeping type of raspberry. Um, that bright red brilliant guy on the right, that's a jack-in-the-pulpit fruit, um, which fall to the ground when the stem withers. Um, so that would be like the perfect place for a turtle to find it and eat them up. Um, and then lastly is maple leaf viburnum. And of course the turtle isn't going to climb the bush to get the fruit. Um, however, maple leaf viburnum in the woodlands is often so mangled from deer damage that it's very low growing and, and often has quite literally low hanging fruit um, that turtles could reach. Uh, so I put that one on there too. Great, and somebody did a little bit of sleuthing for us on Google. Thank you, oh. uh, Louise. Oh. <laughs> Mayables will not soft po- self-pollinate. They need to genetically cross with different individuals to set seed to get around this problem. They rely on their spread of seed via their fruit and pollinated flowers are followed in early summer by fleshy lemon-shaped fruits, a berry, um, and containing several tan seeds. Um, Alma asks, for small yards and urban settings, would you avoid plants with toxicity? Um, certainly, I think, you know, if you have small children or pets, you need to be obviously cognizant of, of what uh, they might eat uh, um, and plan accordingly, so. I was just going to say it depends how much you like your neighbors, but <laughs> your answer was better. Uh, that too. <laughs> now that is a good question though. We get that at the nursery all the time. We've had people return plants because they go back later and decide that, no, it wasn't, they don't want to plant something with poisonous berries. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think a lot of it's overreacting because it, we we encounter poisonous plants every day of our every day of our lives almost i mean a rhododendron for example extraordinarily poisonous if you were to eat the leaves or the flowers of a rhododendron um and they're in like 50 percent of backyards in america uh, with dogs and kids and cats and and everything else and no one ever thinks twice because it's not labeled toxic at the nursery but it's very poisonous um tomatoes Tomato plant, you, you would get violently ill if you just took a bunch of the plant and ate it. Um, so it's really, it, it, that just comes down to how comfortable you as a gardener feels of having it in your garden um, and how stupid you think the people are that might come into your garden that'll just start picking things. Now, little kids, I understand because they don't know better. Um, but what a great educational opportunity for children uh, to teach them not to not to pick and eat random things. I remember that lesson as a child um, with my grandmother's yew bush outside, one of those berries that you squeeze and the sticky sap comes out. And those are poisonous to eat, especially for children. I remember playing with them as a kid, popping them, and my nana being very serious about uh, do not eat those. You know, they're not to be eaten. You, you'll get very sick. And I never did. So, yeah. um, but funny story. So I had a nightshade growing in my garden and, um, I do have a landscaper who does the heavy lifting in my garden. So the things like bringing in soil or bringing in, um, you know, taking out big tree limbs, I'm, I'm, there are just some things I'm not physically able to do. Sure. And he said, Hey, um, I saw this plant and we have that in from the country I'm from, and I'm just wondering if I could take it home and eat it. And I'm like, um, I wouldn't recommend you do that because, <laughs> uh, you will die. Uh, but I, I said, you know, cause the crew actually wanted to eat it. Cause, and so 
Yes, he's very serious. Uh, nightshade plants can kill you and mushrooms. A lot of mushrooms are that grow naturally are extremely poisonous. Yes. So, you know, it, it is amazing uh, what we grow in our gardens that you would not even believe are poisonous. We could do a whole, uh, we should probably do a Halloween session on that, Brandon. That would be a uh, good one. The garden yeah. that could kill you. Uh, yep. But uh, there's actually a garden in the United Kingdom called the Death Garden because everything yep. planted in that garden will kill you. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> like huge warning signs and it's surrounded by this wrought iron fence. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So, yeah. So this is the common pawpaw, which is in like the recent decade become a very famous native plant, especially with the foodie movement and all that. And the, yeah, uh, the movement of more people kind of returning back to that, uh, uh, sort of subsistence lifestyle and homesteading and things like that. The pawpaws really become popular with those, with those folks. Uh, and for good reason, because as far as growing, a, so pawpaw, I guess I should say, it, it's our largest native fruit um, that grows on a tree. Uh, so it, it, they are big, they're about the size of mangoes, although some are smaller. Um, and as far as growing fruit, it's always a very daunting thing for gardeners. So thinking about growing apples or peaches or stuff because there's so many pests um, and diseases and fungal issues and all sorts of things and very specific pruning that needs to be done if you really want to get a good crop of apples or pears or whatever. Um, but pawpaws are a bit different because they really, they don't tend to suffer from any diseases virtually. Um, uh, very little, um, and they have very few insect pests as well. Um, it is a native plant, so of course it fits right into our local ecology. So it makes sense that it has all of the defense factors it needs to keep pests at bay. It's always ironic that when we grow uh, an, an exotic species of plant for food, like an apple, which are from China, uh, and then we get upset by the pests, uh, but the pests are native insects, usually, um, that are just utilizing this plant that you planted for them that has no natural defenses against them. Uh, so that's kind of what you, what you run into there. Um, but with the pawpaw, you don't run into that at all, uh, which is great. Uh, below there is the native range of the pawpaw. Uh, so you can see it grows mostly in southern Pennsylvania, although it will grow up into New York, as you can see, and there are gardeners, I believe, even in like um, or, uh, uh, Vermont that are successfully growing them with some light protection, so. Uh, it's really oh. delicious, and it's the host for that beautiful butterfly in the top right corner, a zebra swallowtail. So if you want zebras in your yard, you need to plant at least two pawpaws. Yeah, yeah, great. So this is a pawpaw that I picked at the nursery. Well, there's, there's two different pawpaws pictured, but the one on the scale, uh, I picked at the nursery last season in September, and you can see uh, that it weighed over a pound, it weighed a pound and a quarter, just that one pawpaw. Um, and it was not a name variety, it is just a species, but it just was an especially uh, well-pollinated branch that produced some really nice fruits. And you can see that pawpaw was so big that it actually had two rows of giant seeds in it. So you can see the circular picture of it cut open. It had a lot of seeds. Um, and below is a more typical size pawpaw uh, with one row of seeds. And that seed is important. That's what we're talking about here. And you can see the size of the seed, it's quite big. It's, it's almost as big as the quarter. Um, in fact, it's definitely as long as the quarter, just might not be as broad. Um, and it's about as thick as the pencil. Uh, so it's a big seed um, and a big fruit, uh, which if you're talking about an animal eating the whole thing and pooping the seeds out somewhere else, you're talking about a big animal, uh, something with a big mouth that can fit that, right? And a big gut uh, to swallow it. Um, so here's that big animal. Um, what the heck is that? Well, <laughs> there's a good reason you've never seen one. And that's because it went extinct about 11,000 years ago. Um, however, in terms of Earth's timeline, 11,000 years ago is a drop in the bucket. I mean, that's nothing. Very little on Earth, aside from humans <laughs> and what we've done, very little else has changed over 11,000 years. Um, the climate, of course, has changed a little. Um, 
Otherwise, it's not like we have major topography differences and all the continents were at the same place as 11,000 years ago. So nothing major difference, but obviously human activity has what has made the difference. And that will link directly, unfortunately, to the extinction of that giant ground sloth, which is what that thing is there. And the giant ground sloth was a huge beast, right? And there was many species. This is the Jefferson's ground sloth. Uh, which was the smallest of the giant ground sloths, small giant. Um, and even though it was the smallest, it was still really big. In fact, here is its fossilized poop. Um, so interestingly, these ground sloths are very good at finding, staking out caves. They like to live in caves. Um, Pennsylvania is no stranger to caves. Pennsylvania has extensive systems of caves. Um, but generally when they find these fossilized poops in caves, it's out in the West um, because the arid climate has allowed for the preservation of such excrement. Um, but that big poop is important because it's as big as the guy's hand, which is as big as a pawpaw. So obviously a big pawpaw seed could pass through in one of those poops, um, which is very important. Um, so what we have here is a little bit more info on this ground sloth. And there's an artist's depiction in the bottom. Um, they kind of gave it face markings, just like a regular uh, three-toed sloth has that lives in South America. Um, so this guy lived approximately 5 million years ago up to about 11,000 years ago. So he's on Earth for quite a long time. Um, it was nine feet long from snout to tip, from uh, snout to tail tip, uh, and easily six feet tall on its hind legs and weighed over a ton. Um, there's a picture down below that shows kind of the size compared to your average uh, human. Um, big, definitely as big or bigger than like a grizzly bear. Um, big, big animal. Uh, it, could fit its, it could fit your head in its mouth if it wanted to. And there is its, its former range. Now, when we talk about the range of anything extinct, there's always missing pieces to the picture because we can't dig everything up. We can't look for fossils everywhere. Uh, so we never quite know entirely, um, but we can at least paint a picture based on fossils that they have found. So. This kind of is based on loose fossil evidence of where the range is. And what I find especially interesting about that map is how much it relates to the map of the pawpaws distribution. So if we wanna put that into a little more context, um, we have to go even before the pawpaw and the megalonks existed uh, to when they had common, you know, further back ancestors, because it's most likely that both species ancestors originated in South America, uh, not North America, and they moved north as they, as they, as they migrated, right? Both moved with one another more than likely. Um, a lot of megafauna actually moved up from South America into North America during a time called the Great Biotic Exchange. And what happened there is North and South America collided and they touched right at Panama and finally connected with this little land bridge and allowed for animals to move either down into South America from North America or North from South America up into North America. Um, and that exchange created a very interesting uh, switch of organisms, um, including some of our extinct megafauna like these sloths, which would have moved up over this land bridge, up through um, Central America, modern day Mexico, and into the Southern United States, where it would have continued moving. And all along while these animals are moving, right, they're pooping, they're leaving seeds of things that they ate before. So I kind of like seeing it as a progression as is they move a little, they go a little, they eat a little, and they leave a little, right? So as they go, they're leaving some behind and slowly building a new ecosystem behind them. And this, of course, is a process that took millions and millions of years. And it's kind of hard to conceptualize because it's just such a long span of time and so many little things happening. Um, but nonetheless, there's, there, there's several pieces of evidence that could back up that um, these 
animals moved plants from other areas of the world. And one piece of evidence is when we look at the family that the papa lives uh, is part of, the Ananasi family, and it's the only temperate member. All of the other members of the family, which are several hundred members, are all tropical species living in South America, um, the tropical Asia, and even tropical Africa. Um, so at some point, they all had a common ancestor, probably during Pangaea, when all the continents were attached. And they, it was some ancestor that lived in this tropical uh, spot, this hot spot of Pangaea. And when the continents split, that, that ancestor got split with it and slowly over time through isolation changed into new plants. Uh, the pawpaw being a remnant today. Um, so pretty cool. And certainly, you know, it's a hard coat seed and it needs to be scarified. We think perhaps that maybe their teeth were part of that scarification process, right? Right. So you can imagine like the big chewing molars that this thing had, it could easily nick the seed coat of the seeds. And then also their stomach acid. So those seeds floating around in that big gut um, would get softened by the acid uh, in the stomach. Uh, so when the seed came out, not only was it in a perfect little pile of fertilizer to give it a start, um, but it was also softened and ready to go. So do you need a male plant and a female plant or just two plants? Good question. Health. Good question. So no, you do not need a male and a female. Um, pawpaws have perfect flowers, um, but you do need two. They're just not self-pollinating. Very fascinating. And if you've never had one of these, um, probably why you won't see them in the grocery stores, they're quite um, fragile. Uh, they don't travel well, but um, they're showing up more and more in uh, our uh, local farmers markets. And if you're here in central Pennsylvania, there is a Paw Paw Festival every fall down in York, Pennsylvania. And yep. uh, last year they had like a different, a whole tray. You could try different ones because there's an Allegheny and a Wild and other ones that you might uh, find very appealing. And each one tastes a little bit different, which is really fun. So yeah. um, highly recommend trying, trying one and growing them in your yard so you can have some zebras in your yard. Yeah, and even if you find you don't like Paw Paws, which... It's like 50, it's like cilantro. You either like it or you hate it. Um, I like cilantro for the record, um, but, and I like pawpaws. Um, but even if you don't like pawpaws, it's still a very cool tree to have. It's a beautiful tree, uh, very ornamental in form and shape. Um, and if you have a natural area, uh, not only great for supporting wildlife and you know, the zebra swallowtail and other animals that may eat the fruit, um, but also just a neat um, habitat builder because it's a thicketing species and spreads by its roots. Um, and if you plant it in your yard, you just mow around it and, and it won't sucker and you can have a very nice formal looking tree. Um, but if you plant it in a natural area and you let it sucker, it'll go on for acres eventually. Thus the, <laughs> the, the pawpaw patch. Uh, yeah, the pawpaw patch. Song. <laughs> yeah. So what else have you got for us, Brandon? All right, so basically, what happened 12,000 years ago that all these magnificent beasts, these animals that we call megafauna uh, went extinct. And really what happened is, is that humans moved from Asia into North America. So the ancestors of the Native American tribes came from Asia across the land bridge um, in the Bering Sea when Russia and Alaska freeze together and animals and humans can move across it freely. Um, and they simply just moved down into North America and eventually down into South America as well. And the new world was colonized by humans. Um, these humans, of course, were very new in the scene. None of the, none of the organisms in the new world had ever encountered a human. So they didn't, they, they, they had no idea even if they should fear humans, right? Or, or what they even are. Um, so that made a lot of the megafauna easy pickings. Not only are they big, slow, and easy to, to, to find, um, but they just, they weren't fearful. They didn't have a need to know that this was something to be afraid of. So unfortunately, around 12,000 years ago, we started seeing this event happen. And it's known today as the Quaternary Extinction Event. Quaternary describing these four-legged animals. And as you can see, it's like one after the other 
after the other, after the other, within a thousand years, we lost about 99% of our megafauna. Um, megafauna, again, just referring to those big animals, those huge things. Um, the megalonx, by the way, was circled there with the red circle. He was one of the first to get X'd out. And you can see that right below him is an even more gigantic ground sloth that was bigger than modern day elephants. Um, so there's a lot of really big animals. Um, and today, all we're really left with in the terms of megafauna on land are moose, bison, elk, uh, some bear, and uh, our aquatic animals like seals and sea lions, which are obviously very large, um, but they don't disperse seed at all. Um, they eat fish and, and birds and, and, and meat. Um, so they're not uh, contributing. Um, even moose and elk and bison, they, they're not really eating fruit. Uh, so much. They will, um, but they're mostly grazers and browsers. They're eating a lot of foliage. Uh, so unless stuff's getting caught in their fur, like burrs, uh, they're not really responsible for a ton of seed dispersal. Um, they will eat seed, obviously, but they're not after it like other animals are after it. Uh, so we really have lost what we would call like our keystone species, right? Those animals that build habitats. Um, now, would it ever work? No, <laughs> we would, we'd never be able to have our first world um, uh, that we're used to here in America and still have elephants. It just, unfortunately, it, it, humans don't play well with big animals. We just, we never have. And unfortunately, I don't think we ever will. We love them and we want them and we, we care about their existence, or at least most of us do. Um, but it, when it comes to coexisting, it is very hard um, because especially for farmers, um, uh, land developers and things like that, it, imagine trying to grow an orchard if you had to keep elephants out of it. I mean, you'd spend millions in fencing, right? So it'd be very difficult. Um, and farmers in Africa struggle with that every day and in Asia, um, they struggle with that every day. One ingenious thing that I actually saw though, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but now I feel like I have to mention it, is that some farmers in East Africa have started putting beehives on fences um, to deter elephants because elephants don't like getting stung by bees. Um, so if they push at the fence, it disturbs the bees and the bees come out and attack the elephants. And that's actually been seeing a little bit of uh, some, some, some Interesting. progress. Yeah. All right. So the question then is over the last 11,000 years without these main means of seed dispersal, how in the world has the pawpaw survived? And it survived by doing exactly what you're seeing in that photo. And what you see in the photo is a bunch of little pawpaw suckers. Those are all coming from the same root. They're all the same tree, but they all grow into distinctive individual uh, plants. Um, are they genetically distinct? No, they're all clones. So they can't pollinate themselves, uh, which means they can't produce fruit. However, the plant can grow. Um, and as long as the plant is growing and thriving, it doesn't really care if it's producing fruit or not. It would rather, but if it can't, it can't. Um, so if you come to the nursery, uh, on our one hillside, we have a pawpaw patch growing and you can see where the main original tree is. She's big and beautiful, lots of fruit. Um, and then uh, down the hillside, all these little babies coming up. Some of them, you know, a lot of them thinner than my, my wrist, you know, but there are, some of them are six, seven feet tall and they're creating this thicket. And then of course, when one thing goes, something else tends to replace it. And what has replaced the megafauna is us. We've, we've replaced them. Uh, we do it now. We are not dispersing them in the same way, um, but we are planting pawpaw seeds and we are planting pawpaw trees elsewhere. Um, in fact, the range of the pawpaw has grown immensely because of humans, because humans like to grow things where we're not supposed to grow things. So we've pushed the bounds, right? And we we grow it, I think they grow it on the West Coast even. So they have pawpaw out of its natural former range, um, but that's okay because with the extinction of the megafauna, if we didn't do it, maybe one day the pawpaw would become extinct simply because of a lack of genetic diversity. Um, but nonetheless. So um, Kathy asked if the two pawpaws are clones of each other, will they be able to pollinate each other? Nope. You need two distinct plants for sure. You need two plants that were both grown from a separate seed or 
two plants of a different name variety. So if you planted a Allegheny and a Pennsylvania Golden, that'd work because you have two separate ones. Um, and I don't believe that pawpaws tend to be like blueberries where you have mid, late season bloomers and you need to match up specific ones. At this point, most of the varieties seem similar enough that you can get away with planting any two and they'll pollinate one another. But I say just to cover your bases, plant a straight species one too with your name varieties because that'll have the best uh, selection of genetics available for pollination. Absolutely. So what else have you got for us, Brandon? Oh, right. Oh, so this is another tree. We have, it, we have one at the nursery um, by the parking lot. People may have seen it. This is a Kentucky coffee tree. And this is a tree that's in the same boat as the pawpaw. Its former dispersers are gone. Um, so you see those huge pods and they're also really thick. They're like as thick as a thumb, if not thicker. Um, and there was massive seeds in that picture down below in my hand there. Um, and that little tree that I grew on the left, that's in my yard, that's when I grew in college. And I had to manually take a file and nick the seeds individually to get them to germinate. Um, or, and some of them we put in a short bath of um, acid solution. Um, but the ones that we gave no treatment to never germinated. Um, at all. So they desperately require an animal uh, to eat it in order for it to germinate. Um, so the Kentucky coffee tree's natural range has shrunk considerably, uh, probably because it just simply can't disperse in the way it used to. But again, this is another one where humans do like this one as an ornamental tree, and it's now being planted way out of its former natural range. It probably wasn't native to Pennsylvania, even though the map shows it. I just find it hard to believe um but it could have been but either way it's here now because humans are planting it here oh and can there's the, the, can, the, the, can the kentucky coffee tree seeds be used to make a drink yes it that's why it got its name um it was used by uh pioneers as they traveled west as a substitute for coffee um however i don't know what the what the process entails as far as getting it edible into a coffee a drinkable form <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know if they're ground or if they're cooked or or what they did exactly um but that would be interesting to look up good question yeah. great question and there again just to remind you is that former range of the megalonx giant ground sloth so it kind of makes you wonder again because it does have a similar range area there uh makes you wonder very cool. So now some plants, uh, they really do just like doing things on their own. They don't like depending on something else having to do something for them, um, which is a smart move because like we saw there with the pawpaw, once your partner in crime is gone, you're alone. In, in, and everything that you evolved and adapted to have over the last several million years <laughs> is now for naught because your partner, your, your, the thing that you evolved with is extinct. So like in the case of the pawpaw producing a large fruit, in a million years, if all things were left to just be natural, they probably wouldn't produce large fruit anymore because there's nothing eating it anyway. So it's not, it's not uh, serving the plant anymore. Uh, but anyway, so the common blue violet, it's another one where uh, unfortunately either you love it or you hate it. And I wish more people loved it because it's a beautiful little native plant. Um, but, you know, those people out there that love um, a nice lawn tend to hate violets because they sure do invade a lawn. Um, but I consider the lawn invading the violets, but um, to each their own. Uh, violets... There are so many species of violets. It's probably one of the most numerous uh, genera. There's almost 600 species of violets and some of them are very unusual looking. But Viola sororia, the common blue violet is about as typical looking of a violet as it gets. Um, this is a little patch of them at my house in the spring. I never planted one. They just popped up and I let them go. And what you can see there, especially if you look uh, sort of towards the center of the photo to the right of the clump of onion there, 
there is like a very thick little patch of leaves with no flowers on it. And that's because that whole little patch there is just fresh seedlings. Now, why in the world though would all those seedlings grow right on top of each other like that? That just doesn't seem very productive, but there's a reason that they end up like that. And it's very common in a violet patch to see these clumps of like 60, 80, 100 little seedlings in like a little tiny circle. And there's a reason that that happens. So violets, especially our common blue violet here, and most of our native violets do this, but this one is an exceptional example, um, has two types of flowers. So the one flower is the kind you see, the beautiful standard purple blue flowers. Those are called chasmongamous flowers, meaning um, open marriage. Um, it's not what you think. <laughs> um, what they mean is simply that that flower is sharing pollen with other flowers. So it's being pollinated by another flower, preferably from a different plant. Um, but then if you were to pull a violet out of the ground, a nice mature violet while it's blooming, and you look under the crown, you see, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that I had a picture of this seed. So that's the typical seed that you see of violets. You, you usually have to look pretty close to find these because by the time that the seeds start ripening, the bigger leaves come out and kind of cover some of it. So, uh, but you will see that. And you, what you can't see in the photo there is the ileosomes underneath the seeds, but violets are another one that tend to have ileosomes. Um, but then they have a second kind of flower called a cleistogamous flower, which is a closed marriage. And so that means closed marriage. So this flower basically is underground. Um, it never emerges. That's why it's white and has no chlorophyll in it. Um, and it never opens either. It never actually develops into a bloom. It's simply like this bud. And within the bud, it self-pollinates. So it actually pollinates itself. And what it produces are those seeds there. You can see a ripe one that is split open and those white seeds inside. And those seeds are simply inserted right into the ground, right next to the mother violet as an assurance that even if a bunny was above her eating all of her flowers off the whole spring and she never really got a chance to make seed up there, she still made seed under the ground and she still planted babies. And that's why in those patches of violets, you'll often see a patch of like a hundred little violets in one little square inch because that little pot of seeds all germinated under the ground um, and created this little clump. Uh, so what you don't find from those cleistogamous flowers though is a strong plant. So there's a trade-off. What you end up with is a plant that's not as genetically diverse. Uh, and therefore it's usually a bit weaker. Uh, sometimes it can show some symptoms of inbreeding stress. Um, and sometimes they never even really mature and bloom and they just kind of die out. Um, but nonetheless, a few of them would definitely be okay, at least. Uh, so the plant can always have that assurance that even if pollinators worn out pollinating my flowers up above or animals are eating me, I'm still getting babies out there. And the jewelweed, well, I should pause. Did anyone have any questions about the violet? Well, I'm going to make a plea for the violet because that's our yes. host plant for our oh, fruit okay. berries. So yes. uh, certainly if you're a butterfly lover like me, um, I highly recommend if you find them in your lawn and you can't tolerate them, maybe dig them up and throw them in your shady areas um, so that uh, we can host more fruit berries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great point. You know, they dig very easily. You can practically pull them out of the ground because they have a very thick rhizome. So even if you break the roots off, they'll grow back. Um, you really don't even have to like dig up in your lawn if you don't want to disturb the grass. Uh, sure. You just pull them and you'll probably transplant okay. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, take advantage. It's free native plants popping up in your lawn. <laughs> so enjoy them. And then, you know, like you said, they serve a, a wonderful benefit. And not only the butterfly larvae, but violets are an early bloomer. Um, so they're really important for some of our native bees and stuff that emerge early and look for those types of things to feed on. So Janet asked, does the self-pollinated violet produce flowers that are then standard pollinated? Yes. So when the little plant grows up from those self-pollinating seeds, 
They will grow into a normal violet that will have both types of flowers. Yep. One plant has both kinds of flowers. And are the violets the same ones that have the taproot that are in the lawn? They are hard to remove. Um, yes. So it's like a horizontal rhizome. Um, and it kind of gets this like thatch work of roots. So you'd sort of have to, you'd have to like hook under it with your finger, like feel around, hook under it, and give it a quick pull. Um, and you should be able to pull it up. But if you just get a trowel underneath it, you can cut the roots and, and hoist it up. Yeah. Great. And I love the next one that you're going to show. I have that in my woody area uh, and it's just gorgeous. And the hummingbirds, it's one of their absolute favorites in the fall. That is so true. You can't beat this plant for hummingbirds. They love it. And if I was a hummingbird, I'd love it too, because look at that little flower just hanging there. It's like begging for somebody to come visit it. It really is like a little jewel hanging there. This plant is called jewelweed. And there's two species pictured there. There's the impatience uh, capensis, the orange one, um, which is generally the one that we see. We tend to see that all over. If you uh, you, you go somewhere with a stream or a lake or, or just damp woods or something, you'll see some jewelweed in, in the late summer blooming like crazy. And below it is the uh, impatience pallida or the pale jewelweed. Both grow in Pennsylvania. Impatience pallida has yellow flowers instead of orange and it tends to be a little bigger. Um, they are annual plants. I do think that's why some people overlook them for the garden because they're not gonna come back every year. However, what I will say about jewelweed is that it will come back every year, just maybe not in the same spot because it reseeds readily, readily. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Uh, some people might find it to be too much. Uh, it's definitely great for a natural area. However, because it's an annual, it has these like glorious little shallow roots that you can just go boop, and the plant pops right out. Um, so if it ever got to be too much, you can remove them very easily. Um, it's also a good plant if you had like a tough area where it's like wet and it's hard to work in and you get a lot of weeds and a uh, great plant to plant there because it, what happens is it spreads so aggressively that they often uh, outcompete uh, weeds and it grows so quickly once it starts growing that it shades things below it. So it's a good one for like a tall ground cover. Uh, good plant for that. So this plant goes ballistic. And what that means is that it literally explodes. So what you see on the left is the fruit, the little pod that the seeds are in. And if you notice, by the way, the other name, touch me not, is because when you go to touch those little fruits when they're ripe, they explode. And you end up with what you see there on the right is this little thing with all these green segments that get peeled back like little springs. And that's exactly what happens. The end of it splits. It's all pulled very tight, like a spring-loaded mechanism. All the, the sides peel back and the seeds go flying and literally flying. Did it work? I hope so. <laughs> um, but they can fly up to 30 feet. Um, so they can really travel a good distance. Um, and therefore, if an animal goes, or a human goes walking through a patch of jewelweed, you will feel them hitting your face. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool and crazy at the same time. Um, you can hear them popping. It's really neat. Um, so this is a plant that really has decided, I'm doing this on my own. All I need is something to just bump me. And it could even be another plant on a windy day that just brushes it and does it. They don't even need animals to do that part. So it has totally scrapped the idea of using animals or wind or water as dispersal. And it just says, I'm just gonna throw my seeds just like you would scatter seeds in your garden. Um, and that's how it disperses. Now, granted, because they grow by water, it is very likely that a lot of jewelweed seeds end up in water and go floating away and end up somewhere else and disperse that way. So surely that can happen. Um, but really its goal is just to send that seed as far in any direction as it can all by itself. And it's a very, very effective method. If you plant jewelweed in one area, Within a couple of years, it will be everywhere. You will find those seeds end up absolutely everywhere. Um, it's really neat. 
I, I love this plant. Uh, one of the reasons I love it is you'll usually find it growing by poison ivy and it is a way to cure yourself of poison ivy. If I think I've accidentally touched poison ivy, I'll go grab some of the leaves and stems and just rub it on my skin until I can get in and scrub up. And uh, very rarely do I get poison ivy uh, because of that. So, yep, yep. Yeah, it's great too. Even if you've already gotten poison ivy and you're really dealing with the awful itch and the rash, the jewelweed crushed leaves are a great salve to put on it. And it really does help with the itch um, and probably will speed up the, the recovery. Um, and interestingly on that note too, it isn't named jewelweed because the flowers hang like little pendants, like I always long assumed. Uh, to find out why it's called jewelweed, you have to physically go and take a jewelweed leaf, flip it upside down and hold it underwater. It's got some kind of very strange um, uh, hydrophobic quality where the leaf won't get wet and the water will beat around it even underwater. And it creates this shiny silver surface on the leaf and it looks like silver, like jewelry. Oh, that's cool. So that's how it got its name. Um, but you don't see that unless you hold it underwater. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. So uh, Linda asks, is there a pink variety of jewelweed? Um, balsam is in the family and it's, I've got a red and white striped one, but do you know if there's a pink one? What was Linda asked that? Linda. Well, Linda, if you've got pink jewelweed, you're very lucky because there are very rare occasions where jewelweed is sometimes pink. Uh, and it's quite beautiful when it is pink. Um, and I have seen a few examples shared online before and I've seen people beg those people that shared it for seed. Uh, so you might have something pretty special there. Um, but really all that is, um, it's not, it's likely not a separate species unless you bought an ornamental one that I just am not aware of. Um, but it's just a genetic fluke where the color is just expressed differently and sometimes is pink. I have also heard of it occasionally being white, but I have never seen a white one ever. So I, I don't know. So I'll, I'll trade you some orange for pink. Uh, that sounds really yeah. cool. And Jess, Jesse Schiffler shares that jewelweed puts a white racing stripe on the backs of visiting honeybees. That's something I didn't know. That's very cool. A white racing stripe, like from the pollen or the Probably nectar or something? Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. The flower shape is rather unique. Um, you can see how the bee would enter the flower, but there is something above it that will rub on its back. Yep. That, that is interesting, yeah. So what and, else have you got for us, Brandon? Did we catch them all? <laughs> oh, well, and again, um, here jewelweed is another, just like the violets, um, sometimes it even does its pollinating by itself. Um, again, its main pollinator is hummingbirds, and it also, you know, it's pollinated by butterflies and bees and, and all those good guys. Um, but these are flowers, just like the violet had, where, while not underground, they are up on the plant. Um, these flowers you will usually witness in the very late season, when nearing the first frost, when the plant is really sensing the shorter days and the cooler nights, and it thinks mm, there's no point in me producing these full flowers yet because they're just gonna get destroyed by the frost and they're not gonna have time. So it will push out a few of these Chlystogamous flowers, uh, self-pollinate them, and usually the fruits that result are very tiny and only have a couple seeds, but hey, it's better than nothing if you didn't have good luck pollinating, right? So uh, they will squeeze a couple of those out. And again, you can see those at the tips of the plants uh, in the very late summer and they're quite small. Um, they're smaller than the developing flower bud. That's kind of how you can tell them apart. Yeah. And there, like I said about jewelweed being a ground cover, uh, that's like, you know, year one after planting one jewelweed plant, what you end up with, you'll end up with hundreds. Um, but it's a, great, it's a great plant for that. And if you decide you didn't want any more, you just either rip it out or you take the weed whacker and cut it down. It's an annual, so. All right, and then the last plant, the last uh, interesting dispersal that we're gonna talk about is surrounding this jack pine. 
Uh, whoever asked, by the way, about the Evergreen for Zone 3, uh, Jack Pine would be an awesome one. This is a very cold hardy pine, as you can tell by its native range up into Canada. Um, this pine really doesn't grow in Pennsylvania naturally, though it, there may or may not be some natural populations out by Lake Erie. It's kind of hard to tell if they were natural or planted, but uh, it's more northern in range. Um, there are huge swaths of woodlands up in Canada where it's literally nothing but jack pine forest. Um, and this pine is a really interesting one because its seed um, not, it not necessarily is dispersed by something strange, um, but is made available after a very strange event. So let's find out a little bit more. Um, so what makes this, this pine uh, unique is that like some other pines, it has these serotonin cones. Um, which just means that they're sealed up with a sappy resin. And you can see that in the image. You can see the white uh, resin over it, and you can see that the scales are all very tightly closed. We have one of these on the fence line at the nursery, and the cones really do stay sealed, like, forever. I mean, they will hang on that tree for years sealed up. It's really fascinating. Uh, and then we bring them in the greenhouse and leave them on a tray for a couple of days, and they open up in the sun. Uh, but... Once that resin, um, once you remove that resin, you can open the cone and you can dump out all the little seeds. Uh, so that's what we did, what I just said. We go and we collect the cones and then we either lay them out on trays and hope that they open or we pop them in the oven at a low temperature for about an hour and then they'll crack open from that. So obviously with the oven, that was the hint there, right, is that heat works. Heat is really what will break down the resin. It's like glue. So like glue, if it gets warm and hot, you know, it can become melty and runny again. So what is going to break open that cone in nature? Fire. Wildfire. Something that humans have come to really fear. Smokey the Bear probably ruined wildfires for nature. <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 of course, though, again, just like how we can't coexist easily with elephants, we can't coexist easily with wildfire either. It becomes very dangerous and very deadly very quickly, and people lose everything, including their lives. So I, I don't mean to sound light talking about wildfire, but of course, wildfire is a natural phenomenon, and it's very important for ecosystems. Um, especially in temperate regions. Wildfires do not tend to be as significant in tropical areas because it's too wet for wildfires to even really burn. Um, but in areas like grasslands, even in sub-Saharan Africa and stuff, they're kept very clear by grazing animals and wildfires in the off seasons. Um, so the wildfire will ravage through a forest of jack pine um, and while doing so, all that intense heat churning up in the forest, all those cones up in the trees, that resin will start dripping like wax off of those once it heats up. And those cones will pop open and the seeds will float away. And what's interesting is when this happens during a wildfire, think about when you're near a fire, picture, picture a fire and what is happening. Everything's rising, right? All that hot air. It's coming off of the fire and immediately rising. It's how you get a hot air balloon to take flight. Fill it with hot air and it will rise. Well, it's the same idea with these seeds. They're up in the trees, all this hot air, the cones are cracking open, there's this hot air flushing through. Those seeds get caught right up in that and they go flying away in this, in this heat. Um, and as we know, we've seen some serious wildfires, uh, well, around the globe, but as, you know, in the United States, uh, over the last couple of years. And even over here in Pennsylvania, over a thousand miles away from California's wildfires, and we were seeing the smoke and even being able to kind of smell the smell of fire. Um, so you can imagine how far potentially a tiny little seed like that that weighs practically nothing could travel in those, in those winds after a wildfire. There is a woodland post wildfire. Uh, it's, it looks like a you know, war zone, there's nothing, there's a lot of ash um, and a lot of charred trees uh, and probably dead things that unfortunately didn't make it out. 
But usually within a couple months after wildfire, you start seeing this happen. You start seeing the forest floor turn into this mosaic carpet of life. And this woodland actually is a post wildfire. You can see the charred trees in the distance. You can also see how no trees have any leaves whatsoever, or any needles, I should say. But what you do see is hundreds of little jack pine seedlings growing up in the place. And what that leads to is this huge seed bank of all these jack pine seeds in the forest floor. And they're all germinating at once. And they're creating a stand, a stand of young jack pine, which is one of the most valuable habitats in Canada. This supports numerous uh, multitude of birds and small mammals and insects and um, just all kinds of things, even reptiles and amphibians and everything. It's such good dense cover, uh, these jack pine forests. Um, and there's lots of food available because they produce a lot of cones with seed that the birds can pick open if they really dry at it. Squirrels and things will eat them. And then, of course, the thick brush allows for lots of little understory plants to safely grow in there, too, with not being predated by deer and other animals as easily. Important, very, to this um, warbler which, oh my gosh, now I'm embarrassed because I'm totally forgetting the name of the warbler. Uh, That's um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I forget the name of it. But this little warbler um, is an endangered species. Um, and it's endangered because, um, one, logging, right? So we go in and uh, Canada has a huge logging industry, so they go in and clear areas like this to plant better trees for future logging. So that's one. And two, because we don't get these areas unless we have wildfire, and we fight wildfires until they're out. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't allow for these habitats to rebuild. And therefore, little guys like that warbler, which oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot your name, little buddy. Well, Barb um, and Sandra say it's a Kirtland's warbler. Thank you. Me thank too. you. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's it. I knew it was someone's name, but then again, a lot of them are. Um, but yes, yeah, so the Kirtland's warbler. So absolutely depends on this type of habitat, So, which is only possible through fire. Uh, which I find, I, I just find that absolutely fascinating. And even more fascinating that the tree has specifically designed its cones to basically wait for the right time. Because why drop seed at your base if you're growing and you're healthy? Let's wait until I get knocked down by fire or something, or there's definitely room for my progeny to grow. So it makes a lot of sense. And oh, this I is such a great presentation, Brandon. You're getting tons of kudos in the, awesome. uh, in the chat. Fabulous information. Right. Great presentation. I think, so I think that was it. Thank you so very, very much for everyone too that joined us here. Uh, I think this is one of the most fascinating presentations I've seen. And uh, hopefully it's inspired you to try something new in your own gardens. Um, and thank you so much, Louise and Brandon. You put a ton of work into this and it was awesome. Despite our technical issues, I think people <laughs> still loved it. So um, everybody's saying so much fun, learned a lot. Uh, so we appreciate our Facebook audience as well as everyone back here learned so much. Look at that. You got the keto. Awesome. You're a great teacher, Brandon. Yeah. Um, Thank you everyone for, for, for being with us. It, it's an honor to have you join us. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, please share this presentation. We will be sending a link on YouTube to the presentation in the next few days for everyone. So yep. share it with others that you might find this interesting and Visit Edge of the Woods uh, in Oresville, Pennsylvania, and uh, certainly my channel too, uh, Garden Thoughtfully on YouTube. We appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank Happy you. Happy Sunday, yeah. everybody. Yeah, thank you, Heather. My pleasure. Have a good, Anytime. good day, everyone. Bye-bye, guys.